Hello and welcome. So this episode is kind of a little bonus episode. It is a preview, if you will, of the kind of episodes we put on Patreon. So if you enjoy it and want to hear more episodes like this, where we have a substitute teacher, head to patreon.com slash night classy and get started for as little as $1 a month. Also, this episode is brought to you by our favorite sponsor, Ethel Ambrosia. And Ethel Ambrosia currently has their best deal ever going on right now. For a limited time, you can get Ethel Ambrosia for either 15% off or you can buy a box and get one for 50% off using our promo codes that I'll share with you in a minute. So you might not need two boxes of gel shots, But you know what you can do with the second one? You can give it as a gift. Teaching has never been easy. And in these times, being a teacher is harder than ever. You should maybe give a little gift to your teacher friend and make their day, make them feel a little less stressed. And now is your opportunity. So you can use our promo code NIGHTCLASSY15. That's a capital N for night and capital C for classy 15 to get 15% off your order or enter the code NIGHTCLASSY BOGO. That is NIGHTCLASSY B-O-G-O at ethelambrosia.com. There will be a link to all of that in the show notes and please enjoy the episode. Okay, so uh, Marcus, do you know your lines? So we uh, go. <laughs> I know I'm saying, and I'm Marcus. Yeah, yeah that's, that's your only Perfect. line. <laughs> also, okay. should we call you Marcus or Dr. Marcus or what? Oh, um, yeah, I grew up being called Mark. And then uh, when I got to Harvard, everybody's like, oh, like snobby. And I'm like, oh, Marcus. And I was like, yeah. okay, that's fine. <laughs> and then when I did Survivor, people who called me Marcus knew me from the show. And then people who called me Mark, like, knew me from elsewhere. And so it was like a nice distinguishing thing. Yeah. And now it's just like, I just point and tell me what to say. <laughs> every time anything. every time Alec refers to you, he calls you Dr. Marcus. So we've been like <laughs> teasing him that like he should start calling you like <laughs> Daddy Marcus. <laughs> <That's, that's laughs> <laughs> Alright, well anyway, um I'm Kat. I'm Haley. And I'm Marcus. <laughs> and this is Night Classy, the podcast where two teachers unwind, sip wine, and discuss the topics we wish we could teach at school. And we have our very special guest, Marcus Lehman of Survivor Gabon and uh, Labor of Love, as Labor well as love. the three. The th- yeah. I kind of want to know more about the three. I do too. What was the <laughs> premise of that show? Uh, th- that one, it was three girls and they would meet, they met a bunch of guys obviously and they could pick who they want to date and like actually there was a couple that wanted to date the same guy and then they kind of worked their way down to to one each and so it was a little bit more of a group format which Mm -hmm. actually was really cool because you kind of had some comparison instead of being tunnel visioned into this one person yeah did it so did the girl who picked you was that who you would have picked the three is that how that works? Yes. And so, well, so, yeah, we're through. It was it was really the three girls were the main characters, mm-hmm. and then the guys were the contestants. And so, of the three girls, like, yeah, I think initially she was. I think I had more in common kind of towards the end with uh, maybe one of the other ones. But then at that point, it was like you know we were kind of paired up a little bit, and then yeah. I didn't end up kind of ending up with the girl, so. It, it worked itself out. And can we find this somewhere to watch it? I I haven't <laughs> talked about or thought about the show in like <laughs> probably since it was filmed. So I, I don't know, very possibly, but yeah, I, I don't have I'll, any way to direct you. I'll investigate. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Did I'm you sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We have mimosas this morning. Yes, we so do. We Cheers. came prepared. It's on. Yes. Cheers. Press. Do you have some um, water? Oh, coffee, coffee. Yeah. Coffee was a must for me as well. Um, this is like an early morning for us cause we're teachers as you know, and we've been sleeping in like all summer, like before <laughs> summer <laughs> yeah, yeah, since quarantine basically yeah. started. So this has been like an early morning. For yeah. Us. This is a little rough. Not going to lie. <laughs> But sorry thank you. No, no, no thank don't be you sorry. Thank for you coming so on at all and, and making the time. We've been so excited and honestly a little bit nervous. Like yeah. you're like a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, it's 
<laughs> it was so weird yeah. watching you on Survivor because we, Alec and I binged like pretty much not all the seasons, but most of the seasons. And then immediately after we watched your season, we saw you on Labor of Love and like freaked out. So it's crazy to have <laughs> you here in person. Well, I hope my season was one of the good ones that you guys binged on Survivor. Uh, oh, yeah. I feel like we were one of the last, what they call old school Survivor mm-hmm. seasons. And then, um, yeah, things, things have gotten crazy, crazy, crazy so on different. that show since then. Yeah. So it's like a totally different thing than what we used to do. And then, yeah, obviously Labor of Love was a completely different adventure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm sort of glad to just kind of be back in the real world here for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I bet. So are, are those the only two shows you've done or have you done any more? Um, there, there was actually another dating show. It was called Three. And okay. I did that, like, I think kind of at the end of residency. And that was just a really... Um, I guess they had done a, a version of it in Israel and it was really popular and here it was not so much, but they <laughs> released it during the like Olympics that year. It was like 2012. Oh, that's a mistake. Um, yeah. That's bad timing. Yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes the <laughs> networks confuse me, but uh, that was a CBS one and it was actually really fun to do. And like a lot of these shows, uh, um, I was, I, I kind of was one of the last people there as well. And the other two guys that was are actually still really good friends of mine. Um, in fact, I introduced the guy, one of the guys name is Joe and the girl that he's engaged to now, like met through one of my friends that I put him together with. That's uh, cool. Which is hilarious. I yeah. feel like so with all the, oh, sorry, go ahead. I know. I was saying eventually dating shows actually do work out and somebody actually ends up with someone. It just may not be like the traditional way. Yeah. I was going to say like, we're fans of the bachelor and it seems like that show never works out as planned, but then like, there's so many people that have been part of that show that have found someone from the franchise. So I mean, maybe there's something to it. Eventually I, one way or another it it happens for people. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Have you ever thought about going on the bachelorette? Uh, my, my mom had definitely recruited me to go that direction. The hard <laughs> part, I mean, my, like my real job, unfortunately is like really, you know, it's very hard to take a bunch of time. Mm-hmm. And with the bachelorette, it's kind of the same thing where I would have been the bachelor would have been fun. Cause like, that's a very high value process. Um, it's really hard to be like on one show for however long they film, maybe like two months and then have to like potentially sit down and do another one. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, you know, dating's hard enough without like a camera. Oh, I can't even imagine how draining that must have been or yeah. must be. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like you are any different or have you gotten used to being on camera? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's like everything you've done it a few times. It, what's curious about it is sort of what you think you're transmitting on the camera versus what's being perceived. And it's actually a really cool lesson for life in general, because there's, you know, how you feel like you're communicating and then there's how somebody's receiving it. And then there's this other element, which is the fourth wall, which is how like society and reality perceives what's being transmitted. And so you get accustomed to it, but I don't think you're ever quite sure what somebody else's process is on these things. So it's like, all right, I'm going to do my best to kind of go with my, my story here. And then we just have to see what happens after that. Right. And then with the editing, I feel like reality shows, I don't necessarily think survivor labor of love, but so many of them are so sinister with their editing and the way they can just spin people. I think maybe more labor of love in my storyline on that one. But I mean, again, it's just, it is a TV show. I mean, and ultimately I think that's the difference between like having your own show like you guys Mm -hmm. um, versus like being on someone else's. So we'll see how you guys edit me on this one. (laughs) Well, the video won't be edited. So our Patreons are getting the raw, (laughs) the raw cut here. We're going to edit it. However we look best. So don't worry. (laughs) We collectively. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We won't throw you the bus under the bus on our show. (laughs) Thanks. But yeah, Plus, so we have a whole list of questions. We here. do. Did you uh, did you look over the list at all? Yeah, I mean, you guys are teachers, so I did my homework. I promise. <laughs> we Very appreciate good. that. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna dive in. Okay, I have start. a burning yeah, question. So you're from Cincinnati, right? 
So I grew up in Florida, but I live in Cincinnati now. Yeah. Oh. I, actually, I split time between Chicago and Cincinnati. So okay. Like, like yeah. Cause I saw on your Instagram live that you also have a place in Chicago. So is, is it split pretty evenly between Chicago and Cincinnati? Yeah. So I did an MBA in Chicago at Kellogg, which is a great program. And then I really, I love the city of Chicago. Um, it's just nice to meet a lot of professional people, women, especially just nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe a little easier. No offense to Cincinnati. Just, uh, people get married here. Kat and I were so, just talking about Tinder in Cincinnati. I don't yeah. know if you like do dating apps like that, but we were back for like in November or so. And we were like, Oh, I don't know. It's just not the same as like other cities. So I'm sure no. dating in Chicago is totally <laughs> yeah. different than dating in Cincinnati. <laughs> Presumably much better. Yeah. We went from Nashville Tinder one day, which is off the hook to Cincinnati <laughs> Tinder the next day, which is not so much. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. There's a whole different it's story. It's a big difference. Yeah. There's like, te- you're like, you know, there was a point where you're kind of like, you'll leave town and then you'll come back and then you're like, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Like, literally, like, it's not even, you're just matching with people that you like kind of see on a regular basis. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That was the feeling. Know. Oh, sorry. That was the feeling I got from Cincinnati is that it was like a small town kind of in like a city. Yeah. It's very yeah. unique. It's a- yeah, there's a couple places. I think in the in the long run, it's it's actually an incredible city because you can do small town things, have a really nice lifestyle. I mean, I, I think some of the real estate stuff I do here has just been really really cool because I could never do that in a in a city like Nashville or Chicago. Nashville maybe a little bit more, but yeah, I mean, from a from a dating standpoint, it's a little people kind of marry their high school sweethearts here a lot, which is awesome for them just said I didn't go to high school here. So yeah, uh, right. <laughs> not, not great for anyone else. Yeah. That but is yeah. pretty common. It's like every day I get on Facebook, either people are married or they're getting engaged or they're having a baby. Like, and that's just, I think our age group, but it's also yeah. interesting to see like where it'll be when, you know, we're older, like in 10 years from now, people are going to be getting like divorced or remarried. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. so it'll be a divorce every day, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Broadcasting it to Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably true. Yeah. yeah. And I'm right now I'm in the middle because I am older. And so it's interesting because you don't have necessarily this big network of people that are still doing single social stuff. Um, and, and that's okay. Uh, but then, you know, because of my career, it's not like I have a ton of time to just kind of figure it out. And there comes a point where you're really just like looking at partnerships and you find great people. And, you know, I, I definitely think that that's one of the challenges that our generation faces differently because not every place is a small town anymore. Um, and so people are kind of caught in between the things, which is a lot about what labor of love was kind of trying to explore. I think. Yeah. I was going to say, is that kind of what drew you to labor of love is you're just kind of, were you just done with the dating game, especially going between two cities? I can't imagine what that's like. I think that dating is, it's how you meet people, but it's how you learn about yourself. And you know, if if your approach is like, I can never, I, I can't fail ever then dating becomes a pretty like miserable experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but 99% of the people you date, you're not going to spend the rest of your life with. So, you know, you have to kind of look at it differently. And I think for me, it's just once it's kind of gone this far along, you want to make your choice and make your choices and say, Hey, I'm, you know, do I want to actually spend more time with this person? And I think that's something you figure out the first two hours and the next for the first two days. And you keep kind of extending the contract, I think. Uh, so for me, it, it, it's exhausting only um, from the standpoint of, you know, I do think it is sometimes hard to find people when you've done a lot of things in the world and you kind of are looking for somebody to match you at that level in some ways. And so it's, it's also because of this modern time, we get to meet so many people. And so that's pretty incredible. It's also like, can, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. It's not like you're, my dad, I think grew up in a town of a thousand people. Wow. Period. Whoa. And yeah. And so, you know, his high school sweetheart was like one of 11 people in his class, I think, or something just wow. really small. And so, yeah, I think the, the human brain is still kind of built around that. And so that's the part that I think it's really challenging for all of us, really. Yeah. It's like how they say you should downsize your closet to like mm-hmm. however many uh, classic items and it's like harder to choose what to wear when there's so too many, many options. Yeah. yeah there's yes. a study done. I think I've talked talked about this before, but with like ice cream choices, there was one group that was given a choice of like ice, uh, 
chocolate and vanilla. And then there was another group like of participants that were given a bunch of different flavors and then they rated their satisfaction. And those who had more flavors to choose from were like less happy in the yeah. end. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really easy when there's so many options and people out there to explore to be like, well, what else it could be out there? Like, is this the best me? That could I be like with this person? Yeah. So um, how did you initially get involved with reality TV? Was it on Survivor the first time or? I think it was it was one of these things that reality TV with like the real world and stuff came into existence. And it's just like a really cool thing that like, you know, you grow up with this idea of actors and actresses and all these famous people, there must be something magically different about them. And then suddenly reality TV comes along and says like, Oh, look, here's a normal person that we put on television. And I think maybe for that part of me that does, you know, love the idea of like being famous or whatever, you know, you grow up as a kid, like just one of those like Disney TV kind of movies. This was a manifestation of that. So I was definitely a big fan. And when survivor came out, it was like, that's the ultimate kind of, treasure hunt adventure for uh, a a guy. And so I never really thought about like submitting a video or anything, but then my mom without telling me sent my picture to this cosmopolitan (laughs) bachelor saying she's early campaign to marry me off. I think. Oh my gosh. (laughs) uh, (laughs) I ended up on that and somebody saw the picture and then asked me to like send in a video for survivor. Oh wow. It's like a little time, but that's how I ended up there. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting road to take kind of. Mm -hmm. I feel like so many people seek out survivor, like with Mm -hmm. so much, like their gusto basically. But again, like that was in 2008, but survivor, when did survivor first come on? What year? I don't know. 2001 or 2002. Okay. Okay. Maybe even 2000. I I should know this, but it's it's fine. Did (laughs) you watch it from the beginning? Oh yeah, absolutely. I did. And then, I mean, I was medical school was very busy, but like, there would be times where I would catch the whole thing. And, you know, it was just, it was, it was like watching these people run through these challenges and I'm like, why are you like not really running? Like this, this counts. And once you've done it, you realize like, Oh, cause you're like starving and right. dehydrated and like your body, I mean, can't really run, go any faster. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was neat to be able to see it and then experience it and kind of understand those differences. And I, I love that. Like, I always want to see behind the curtain. Totally. And so that was what really appealed to me. Did yeah. you go ahead? Did you do anything specifically to prepare for Survivor before you went on the show, knowing the conditions that you'd be existing in? I started a fire a couple of times, totally failed. Um, so, <laughs> like, all right, so someone else is going to have to do that. And then um, <laughs> I had been training for like a half Ironman. So like, I felt like physically I was okay, but I got hit by a car on my bike uh, probably about six weeks before the show. And I was like on crutches, like I was, I got hurt pretty badly. Oh, so, no. um, yeah, unfortunately, so I didn't really come in like in prime position, but I would go do like try and walk on like a fence line. Um, I was living in Jacksonville, Florida, but I was doing my residency first year at the Mayo Clinic at the time. And so I would go, I can run through the woods, like just kind of reminding myself of how to like be in nature a little bit. And Florida is pretty good for that because we have like alligators and snakes yeah. and all kinds of things. Florida so it's like, crazy. Right. Yeah. If I can, if I can deal with this. I'll be all right. And then one night I tried to sleep outside and just, I lasted like two hours. I was like, all right, I'm going to have to figure that one out when I get there. Cause this is miserable. Right. Just collect as many like memories of sleeping somewhere warm and bug free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take the AC all day right now. So that's, yeah. that was pretty much it though. And then I realized like without looking back, I mean, that was the part of the show that I could bring. Like I felt like my, it enhanced my, my best efforts, but I was also at that point in my life where like, for me, everything should be a meritocracy. And it's like, Hey, if I'm a good person and you know, I'm honest and all these things, like I will sort of be rewarded for that. And so, you know, once you go through the show process, you realize like, and that's just not how TV or life in a lot of circumstances really works. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was that was the before part. And that's how I was going in mentally, I think, for the show. I mean, I think in a way, though, it did work out. I mean, it, granted, it, you didn't win, but you did make it to the jury. And it, like you were I think you came off very favorably on Gabon, um, especially during the first like half of the first half when your team was on fire and you're kind of. I, mean, <laughs> I think we won the most challenges and yeah. the 
time that we were on there. I mean, that was part of what you kind of saw though, was like you're, once you get everybody organized and you know, you are doing those things well, if they let the show kind of play out the way it, it does, um, you know, we would have just kind of kept, kept rolling, I think. And right. but that's where you kind of start realizing like, as you start to become more successful, you know, there are new elements that come in. And in this case, it's like, well, you know, the, the, the TV show doesn't necessarily want the other group to get steamrolled. And like, that's yeah. kind of it. Now that would make the very end of the show very interesting. But when you're trying to keep viewers like throughout the entire process, you need some more conflict in the middle. And so that's how, you know, they're able to kind of direct things a little bit or steer it one way or the other. And that's not something that I don't want to say I, I, it's never experienced, but like, it's definitely not something you, you kind of plot or think through. And I think that was a uh, probably something that my team all thinks back on now. And it's like, well, you know, maybe we should have, you know, thrown a couple of challenges or gotten yeah. in a few more arguments or something just to <laughs> make it seem a little more contentious than it was. Yeah. But I feel like, yeah, you're in such a helpless position though, at the mercy of the producers, you probably don't even like know to do that when it's happening. It's, Definitely something in retrospect. And it's hundred percent hindsight is also part of the reason I think trying another show or a different genre was really appealing as well. Mm -hmm. I, I will say one of the things that's really interesting about reality television is how much power the interview process has. And so, you know, I, I think I talked about this on one of my Instagram live things, but they ask you questions and they kind of set questions up in a way that now I look back and knowing a little more about psychology and business psychology, I mean, they can anchor you to certain ideas. So I, there was a guy, Dan on the survivor season and he was a really nice guy, but was super anxious and he'd waffle back and forth. And you spent like half a day convincing him. Randy was literally Dan's like caretaker for this. Yeah. Was it, was Dan and, the attorney? Yes. Okay. Dan was yeah. the attorney. And so he was a guy, he was a great athlete. Like you wanted him on your team, but like he'd, you convince him for half a day. You could send Randy out there. Randy's like, all right, we got him back. He'd go to an interview and then he'd come back and it'd be like starting over again. Oh. And the way that they would kind of ask these questions, mm -hmm. like, well, what questions they ask? Like, you know, do you really trust Marcus? And you know, is Randy really on your team? Yeah. And then they make, when you, when you're trying to reply to a question, you speak in full sentences, just like our teachers used to have us do. Right. And you say, you know, I don't trust Marcus because, and so just literally having to repeat the question makes you internalize a lot of the feelings mm -hmm. and stuff. And so it's a, it's a crazy cool mechanism. And also they get like the sound bites they need, but at the same time, they're also kind of, they're able to have some effect on what they're trying to achieve in the show that they're putting together. So it was, it was wild to like kind of understand these other elements of it. It's like, has nothing to do with the challenges sometimes or the work you put in, but there's these other mechanisms that are happening. Uh, just the way that the show's set up. Absolutely. Awesome. Especially for someone who's already anxious, like with anxiety, mm -hmm. you question everything all the time. And so like to be not only like have anxiety to be on survivor and have TV, uh, like cameras around you all the time, but also just to be suggested like that suggestibility in those questions that's built into it. Yeah. People are highly susceptible to stuff like that, especially with anxiety. You're like, Oh man, I guess I don't trust yeah. Marcus. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and just the general yeah, I, mistrust of the game and being yeah. starving and dehydrated. I can't. Yeah. Imagine. I mean, it, you're definitely not in your best like mental moments while you're out there. And it's true. I mean, even those of us that aren't, I, I don't necessarily say I have like a predisposition to anxiety. I can very, um, high functioning. So I maybe have like, like little type a type anxiety, but it's, it, it still does affect you because you're, you're always thinking about these other elements or you're at peace with something. And then that kind of disrupts it. Um, and it, it, it's almost like one of those things where you're playing like a puzzle and the first few rounds, you can kind of keep up with the, the puzzle and they keep adding pieces. <laughs> and then eventually like, ah, crap, I know something's happening right now. I just don't know how to like, really deal with this uh, do you or think it through or did you watch it when it aired your season of survivor i did did yeah. you learn new things that you didn't know while you're actually in the show yeah i mean it's always really interesting to see what the sound bites are um you're hearing things that somebody will kind of recap like person to person but then now you're hearing it the way they actually kind of experienced it and then there's actually a lot of pieces that aren't on the show because it's i think they told us it's almost like 300 hours of filming per episode. So clearly wow. you got to get that down to 
43 minutes. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that doesn't get on there. And so you're trying to piece these pieces together, but you're also realizing like, wow, you know, I, I had no idea that that person was thinking this way or, you know, that, that so-and-so had this conversation, just, I wasn't a part of it. And I had no idea that this would be, you know, something so pivotal in creating either my demise or someone else's or, that they were coming into a conversation I was about to have after that uh, with these other concerns about so-and-so. I mean, it's just, it's amazing because it's, there's, it's only, you know, 18, 20 people to start with. And yet there's already so much different movement that you, you have to try and imagine what it's like to maybe like do real life where there's thousands of people around. So yeah. it's a yeah. crazy experiment. Was there anything uh, that you experienced happening on the show that didn't make it in the final cut that you wish did sorry that was worded horribly but <laughs> there's there was I mean there's some funny experiences where yeah. you're just like there's times we're just like laughing and just having a great time with people that mm-hmm. you wish was part of the show um I think there was you know there's some conversations about like I think some of the characters that because if you do make it for a while they've kind of got to give you a pretty good rap somehow mm-hmm. but then there was just people that there's always an element on survivor people you feel like don't deserve to be there kind of at the end. Yeah. And I think that some of those storylines were always kind of chopped out just for the sake of time or to mm-hmm. make the character look like they knew what they were doing. I mean, my season seemed really unbalanced. We had a bunch of people that were like really intelligent, like moving along thoughtful, strategic. And then there's a bunch of other people that just sort of like, happen to show up. Absolutely. And one, of the, <laughs> one of the things on Survivor that I think is the curse of every actively thoughtful person is that you think, okay, next episode, next vote, like these people are just such a non-issue. And at the end, you know, because everybody gets a vote, no one's a non-issue. And so I almost wonder if there's ever going to be a season where and you always hear the old classic line of like, oh, you know, this person's not a threat. Like, yeah. and that's literally like we all do it. And it's like the, the survivor's Achilles heel. And if somebody would just vote those people out right right away <laughs> and then just battle it out with everybody that they're actually concerned about, it might be a totally different season. But we all did that in our season, too. Yeah. So yeah. is this a subtweet to Susie or Sugar right now? <laughs> uh I, well, yeah, I mean, for our, for our team, it would be Susie for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, she and I like had some good Spanish conversations and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, she made some assurances and we talked about some pretty deep things. Like my, my sister had passed away a couple of years before that. And so, you know, that was one of the stories that we didn't really cover on the show. Yeah. But she kind of, uh, in, in, in some of those conversations, she sort of didn't, I don't know. She didn't kind of honor some, some conversations we had in her decision-making based on that. And so I think that was, that felt like a bit of a low blow at the time, especially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think those are the things that, you know, it's, it's for some people, it's just a TV show or um, I forget who said it, but like, you know, basketball, there's five fouls. And so the last one's the only one that actually counts. And that's how some people see playing basketball. Other people look at it like, Hey, I don't want to commit a foul at all. And so I think you have to kind of understand in life, who are the people that you want to, you know, play with in those settings. And sometimes yeah. you don't get a choice. Um, speaking of who you played with, are you still friends with Charlie? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Charlie has gone on to have like an awesome life, awesome husband, beautiful little daughter. Oh, that's so like, great. he's, you know, doing his thing. Mm-hmm. Corinne is in Colorado. Yeah. I was you know, wondering Randy's about Corinne. Living his best life too. So, <laughs> I mean, I think everyone, stays in touch. Uh, the yeah. charity events and different things that we usually do are ways that we keep in touch and hang out and meet some of the new cast and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, that has not obviously been really very common this last few months. Yeah. So I think some of this stuff is becoming a little more challenging, but yeah, I think everybody, you know, still has wonderful memories and certainly not as much in touch as we were the first few years, but always very fondly thought of for sure. So do you meet newer cast members? I mean, not, Again, not as much this last couple of years because yeah. I think my real life has gotten pretty busy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we try and they there there's probably two or three kind of significant charity events. Actually, there's one in Cincinnati that's usually uh, for the Juvenile Di- Diabetes Research Foundation, uh, and then there's one in California and then one in Orlando. And we try to be a part of them whenever we can. And what they do is oftentimes they'll have a bunch of the older cast members, maybe some different reality shows. 
and they always try and get like, you know, whatever the most recent shows are. That's cool. And yeah, it's usually a nice outcome and raises a bunch of money and, you know, makes it fun for everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, have you met Tony? Tony would be one of my like, you know, want to meet. Yeah, yeah. same. <laughs> Us too. Yeah, he's my favorite. <laughs> Besides you, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, you tell all the reality members, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. So... I want to talk about labor of love a little bit more because that's the one I haven't, I'm not a huge admittedly survivor person. I've watched it like through cat and Alec, like in our house, we were roommates. So I've seen bits of your season, but like we all watched labor of love together and we were immediately like, once we saw the ads for this show, we were like, Oh my God, we have to watch yeah, it. This sounds ludicrous. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, essentially the premise is, um, Christy, the lead of the show, show uh she's ready to start a family and there are contestants i guess some um, potential future partners um and they date it's kind of like the bachelorette but it's like to seal the deal yeah. and have a baby yeah so did you know that it was going to be a christy as the lead of the show well, we we are all kind of at the point where like if we start dating there's not like a thousand things I have to do before I'd be okay. Like starting a family. Yeah. And that was the way we kind of all entered the show. And we did know a person would be the, you know, female lead. And we had like maybe like a 30 second video to just kind of rule out whether this was like a, you know, total no from the beginning or yes. Mm -hmm. oh, and that okay. was it. And, you know, we were kind of going with the premise of, yeah, you're meeting somebody and you're doing some more serious like exploration about what happens after the, the, the dating is over and you get, you know, decide to like settle down and, and do something about it. And were you, did you go in like just ready to go? Like if everything were to have worked out, were you like ready to have a kid with someone like you met? And I don't know what the exact timeline is. If it was just like several weeks, what was that like? Like what were your expectations? <laughs> I guess like if everything went perfectly. Uh, uh, well, I mean, if everything went perfectly, I still think it takes six months, a year to kind of figure out if you want to throw a baby in there or not. Right, um, yeah. You know, so there was that. I think one of the other parts was we had, I think filming was about eight weeks. And so it was like, you know, how do I compare a normal eight weeks of dating to TV show dating? Um, and then you hope that that's compensated by the fact that like, oh, if you've done this national search, she's going to be this like, smoking hot professional put together female that, you know, I would like to say when I say smoking hot, I mean, for me, that's like an inside outside around everything kind of person that like, I'm really going to be compelled to, to want to spend that kind of time and maybe that type of investment with. So that's like the mindset day one that you're going into. And then we are sitting there at the little cocktail intro party or whatever. And Kristen Davis comes out and, keep saying, I mean, she's very attractive. I was like, Oh wow, this is our, you know, this is our girl. Uh, hadn't watched sex in the city. Had no idea. Um, but once I got to figuring out that she was the, the host, were you disappointed she, that it wasn't her? Uh, I, you know, th there, there are pluses and minuses <laughs> Christy versus Kristen. Uh, but she then says like, you know, you all agreed to have a child within a year. And I think we're all kind of like sitting there smiling at this cocktail party. Like, all right, all the cameras are here. There's 50 yeah. people around. I don't think I signed up for exactly that. But right. like, you were contractually now, obligated so. to have a child <laughs> yeah. within a like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, So yeah, but it was one of those, like, I think I jokingly say, like, don't sleep with somebody you don't want to have a kid with. And mm -hmm. I think that's very different mentality than maybe 10, 15 years ago for me. Like if somebody called me the next day and was like, hey, guess what? I would be like, oh, okay. You know, I, I try to make more mindful decisions now. And I think all the guys on the show actually are all in that same position of saying like, all right, I'm at this place because I'm really thinking about these other reasons to be involved in relationships. And so that was what drew me to the whole experience was I want to spend the time around people who are kind of struggling with the same thing I am and want to have some like open candid conversations about it. And hopefully this show provides us with some experiences that help broker that, which it, it definitely did. 
Oh yeah. It was such a cool process to watch and just the concept behind it. We, we knew we had to watch and it was cool to watch you all, you guys living in the house together and just seeing like, although you all were ready and you were on the show for the same reason, I feel like a lot of you are also still in different areas of life. Kind of, there mm-hmm. are some people are as like, Oh, this guy is not ready. <laughs> yeah. To- I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna, I just want to, speaking of not ready, not that, I don't think he was ready, but was it Trent with the stuffed animal? What was that? What, what happened there? Was that like a bit or. I mean, <laughs> everything is a little, is, is always going to be partly a bit, right? Yeah. I mean, you're gonna, <laughs> we're even I was, you know, everyone's on their best behavior. Everyone's mm-hmm. thinking through, but it's also like a practice, like an exercise of, okay, what is this? What does this really mean for me? And him, he has a cat at home named Snoots. And okay. it's like, it's adorable little, whatever the, the like grumpy cat version. Cat, I don't know, it and it's, it's, it's so cute. And so we were like joking and that first little get together we have, we all got a gift that was something for us to kind of talk about. Mine was some shark teeth because I'm a dork and I collect shark teeth from oh. when I was a kid. He got this stuffed cat named, and it was literally the exact like breed or whatever. Oh. And so, yeah, then he spent the rest of the time and he is a like fun clown, like, he's the guy who's going to be the awesomest dad because he like hasn't forgotten how to play with his kids and like creates joy and wonder and like awe for those children. Like that's what Trent is going to be really exceptional as a dad, even if he's good at the other stuff too. Uh, but yeah, on the show, it comes across as like, you know, what is this guy doing? Yeah. I was wondering about that. Cause on the show he came off as like a drunk, like immature crazy person but then like like you said he probably just has like a really fun sense of humor and he's willing to play which yeah that's another thing that shows can kind of distort um, yeah that must have been hard for him he's a guy who can who can have fun in a crowd of stuck up people and yeah. have a good time and like that's good you know, he and i also had really good conversations in the hot tub we called the gentleman's jacuzzi club we, <laughs> we had our like a secret intro handshake <laughs> you know and, and i think that the problem is that the show can only show these little portions mm-hmm. of people and it kind of characterizes them as like this that and the other thing yeah and it it, it uses people's intuition about others to sort of entertained, but I think people were looking for confirmation of their past experiences and a lot of these characters on the show, myself included. And so, and I think honestly, Christy was too. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that just kind of speaks to, I think the dating show genre in general. Yeah. And Um, especially, sorry, go ahead. I was saying maybe it doesn't advance the conversation as much as I would have liked it Mm -hmm. to, but that's, that to me is sort of one of the ethos, uh, behind the, the way that they filmed and characterized a lot of those people. Yeah, because th- with this show especially, it's a dating show, but it's so serious of a premise. Like you're starting a family. So a lot of the show seemed like really serious, really emotional. And then you'd have some comic relief like snoots and it would just like throw you for a loop. It felt like out of place. And I see where they were going, what they were going for. But yeah, it was it was an interesting show. I'd never really seen anything quite like it because The Bachelor kind of pokes fun at itself. But this show seemed to take itself very seriously. Um, which was unique. But I think you make a good point. And I would build on that by saying, isn't it interesting though, that the bachelor is talking about getting engaged mm-hmm. and married and nobody thinks that that's serious anymore. That's and like true. all these 20 some year olds are like, Oh, I love this person. <laughs> like that's a really serious word for people like yeah. me who grew up in maybe a different generation. Like mm-hmm. this is all serious in a certain way. And so I find it interesting that like it's, that's kind of a common theme with the response to labor of love that you kind of like, I don't know. It's a little bit interesting because yeah. I, I think a lot of it was kind of intended. the original bachelor. I remember the first guy, he was like a Harvard swimmer guy. Mm-hmm. I was totally jealous. <laughs> uh, but like he, you know, they, they, the first few really were like, Oh my God, I'm going to get engaged. Cause like, yeah, it's a big deal. Like yeah. that's supposed to be a big deal folks. I don't know. Yeah. Now uh, it but, just seems yeah. like a career launch to be an Instagram influencer. Yeah. I don't think it's yeah. really about marriage anymore. <laughs> totally. And, and like, that's where you kind of want to advance conversations positively. And then you're kind of like, wait, am I just making this like not that important? Um, yeah. So I don't know. It was, it was really interesting comparison. It's like, Oh, now let's put a, let's put a baby on the line. Yeah. And that actually was really concerning to me, especially towards the middle and end where like I'm having like zero one-on-one time with this person. And, you know, I, I wasn't, I, we had some good chemistry, but there's, you know, some, some plot holes and her that I was trying to figure out. 
and you're like, man, if I'm really going to get to the end of this and like people magazine is going to want to see that like prom picture with her, this girl's belly or whatever, you know, yeah. and I'm like, I don't know how I would do that in like good conscience. I certainly wouldn't be able to. And so that's kind of these pieces where you do start feeling this like weird conflict because of, um, you know, the crossing between TV show and like real life decisions. Right. And do you, you meant, oh, sorry. You do, do you that. feel like there were like you left the show still feeling like there were things that you needed to figure out about Christy? I mean, I'm sure there were things, but. <laughs> well, no, I mean, this gets back to like actual dating. Like I've been, I've, for me, I, my job is very, like I work tonight from seven, 5 PM to 7 AM. I work tomorrow night from 7 PM to 7 AM. Like it, it's hard to do that stuff. And it's not like I'm just pushing papers around. Like there are people who are dying of gunshots and some very serious things. So I've taken a lot of time before getting deeply invested in relationships to try and get to know who I'm working with, who this person is. And I spent a lot of time single because of that. Um, I guess I'd rather be alone than wish I was. And so I think at the point that we had gotten a few weeks down the road, Christy reminded me of some other people that I had dated that I didn't necessarily feel like past, you know, a good, maybe couple months relationship. We'd have a lot of opportunity to go deeper. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, I always, like I said, I, I look at the world as how can I, and it's like, you know, would something change if the cameras were off or we were able to have some more conversations? So it was one of those things that you just, you know, I don't think you ever want to say, Oh, well, you're just like this other person I dated, but you start knowing what things can work for you and what things, you know, you, you gotta be careful about. And I was starting to see a little bit of, of that stuff with, with us. And that's, that's also me and what I bring to the table as far as my hopes for relationships and those types of things. So. Right. And dating is about, like you said, you start to become more of yourself by dating other people. You figure out what you want and don't want. And so that's great when you can have like a gut instinct about something and just know based on past experiences that it may not work out favor favorably for either of you. So dating's great. <laughs> Communicating. Well, it, it, it's also practice, right? I mean, I think, your ability to communicate, not just like what makes you cool to be with, but also what makes you really tough to be with. And I don't know that Christy was the kind of person that was really open to that kind of conversation. Um, your ability to also say, Hey, I'm not good at this. Like, I want you to know, like, I'm, I'm really grumpy in the morning. Like I need a hug. And like, that's the first thing I need in the morning. And you know, my mom and my sister used to be like, oh, well, someone's in a bad mood. And that was the first thing I get in the morning. And I was like, that never puts you in a like, better yeah. mood. That's like when you're but mad like, and someone tells you to calm down. A, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. But it's like you're, you're trying to learn these things and be honest about what your kind of failings are in the world. And I trust me, I have much more serious ones than that. But um, I don't know that that was something that she was really super good at. And um, I think that's the stuff you start realizing it's not even necessarily just about the chemistry you have with the person, but also some of like the really practical, honest things that have to happen for you guys to deal with really serious stuff. I mean, I don't think of relationships just like, Oh, you know, you forgot to take out the trash. I think about it as like, Hey, like our child has a, an illness or like the really tough things. Like that's the whole point of being married. Like all this fun stuff is really easy. But like, if you're going to go really deep into a relationship with somebody, it's because you're trying to solve really difficult problems that over time we've found that works best usually when you have like a partner to do that. Yeah. So, and um, she, I will say yeah. as a viewer of the show, having not known her, she did come off a, a little robotic yeah. or like cold. And I may be the same way in her situation, like dating a bunch of guys, kind of like protecting myself. But I feel like we were left trying to figure her yeah, out it was the whole hard show to, as the viewer to kind of relate to her because she definitely put her best foot forward and came across as just this very like polished, confident person, but you also didn't really get to see a lot of her inner emotions or thoughts or feelings. So does, is that what you got from her as well? Were, were you trying to also get to another level of her when you were dating her? It's funny watching this show for the kind of, I saw it for the first time with the viewers, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, 
And then I spent the time I spent with the guys. Um, I know the, the story behind a lot of things and then experiencing our dates and her conversations with me in little bits and pieces, plus a little bit of like the, the over whatever they call it, like the voiceover parts where she makes comments. I started to kind of notice what her tells are as far as the, the insecurities that she was feeling uh, mm. throughout justified or not personal or her or, or, or just common. Um, yeah. I think those were the things I was like, yeah. So this was what I was struggling with. You know, this is not the type of response. Um, I don't know a couple of examples where it was like when Walker gets voted out, she's like, well, I don't want my kids growing up in a funeral home. And it's like, wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah that was a little, that's an easy out. Was, yeah. What, you know, but it's okay for the, you know, for us to go rag on one of the guys for one of their comments or whatever. Yeah. And I get it. It's TV, but like my concern, I think for, and, and all of our concerns were, you know, is this the real, is, is this what we're getting? Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I certainly don't want my partner to show basically no understanding about this or that. Now I can understand the same as me. Like you get your whole thought distilled into one sentence and they're trying to just get one sentence in there. So, so there's probably a lot more to it, but mm -hmm. that was, that was the quintessential struggle there of trying to, to get deeper on somebody that wasn't necessarily going to be super vulnerable because it might look bad on camera. And I will say that's the benefit for me of being on survivor was like, I was like, all right, I get it this time, no matter yeah. what I say or do, <laughs> I'm going to be this guy and they're just going to make whatever character they want. So this is, this is what we get. And if I'm honestly going to use this because just statistically speaking, I am, I have a one in 15 chance of ending up with this girl, you know, I'm going to demonstrate who I am for the rest of the world too, because if it's not her, maybe it's one, somebody watching the show or, you know, maybe I'll meet somebody in the process, whatever, you know, happens. So at some point being honest and frank for me was the best weapon to deal with that fourth wall situation. And for Christy, I think it was maybe trying to go the opposite direction of mm -hmm. let me not share anything or, I don't know. I, I'm very mindful of the fact that, you know, women are trying to be, show their ability to be professional and be everything, um, that, that, that there's this goal trying to be met. And she was trying to embody that. I think maybe as a character on the show, that message that's trying to come across more often today, which I think is a, is a great message. Um, and I think that that's, I don't know if that was maybe driving it. So I can't get into the intention part, but I can kind of, I see what you guys are, are yeah. kind of getting at with the way it came across. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, and you, I feel like you have such a great perspective about the show. Um, just so positive and like, yeah, this is just, you know, an adventure. It's part of life. I had a good chance and, you know, I learned something and I think that's great. And it's been really cool to hear your feedback as a participant in the show, as someone who like watched it religiously every <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah. But well, I will say the editing sucked. I mean, obviously oh it wasn't my, all. Oh yeah. I was going to ask you if you felt yeah. how you felt about the editing. Cause yeah. uh, yeah, it yeah, I felt rough. like your your exit didn't really feel contiguous with how they portrayed you the whole time. It was kind of just this weird this yeah, this weird inconsistency um that yeah, yeah. kind of left us feeling uncomfortable. Yeah. And throughout the whole show in general, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like it was on Fox, right? So like, did they just skimp on like the, the budget or what happened? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think they cut it down. It, I'm, I was trying to think of like a teaching analogy. It, it sort of reminds me of like my mom was a Spanish teacher and uh, my sister taught as well. And it, it, it reminds me of like these stories when I was saying, like, you got this like kid who's just misbehaved the whole time. And like, you send a letter home and then the parent gets mad at you for like <laughs> saying something about the kid. Does yeah, that, yeah. does that ring a bell for you guys at all? in, in something like real life? I mean, yeah, it's, ha it's, yeah. Ha it's, it's happens. happens. <laughs> it's not every yeah, parent, just, but it happens. happens. But well, I know it's not every parent, but like it's that situation where you're like, all right, I'm the one who's being like super honest here. Like, I totally, I, I know enough reality TV, like I, telling Christy about the Kyle situation. Like it wasn't just me doing it. Like everybody's doing this stuff. Yeah. And then the story is just this total opposite situation. And you're like, okay, I mean, I get this is television. I'm not going to like, you know, let it, let it get me. But there's a point where you're like, why couldn't you just tell the real story? And like, actually I thought it would have been interesting 
I mean, the fact that Kyle and Chrissy did not work out, it's like, yeah, we tried to tell you that. And so <laughs> yeah. part of the story here too should be like, Hey, dating isn't easy. You know, even if you're this put together person and you, you you think you're choosing, like it takes a village, like, you know, try and understand how some of these situations might be challenging. Who's trying to tell you the truth, like learn those pieces so that over time you kind of figure out who the actual person is you should be with mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, keep the people who are honest with you close and, the whole thing is just like, I was just scratching my head by the end. Even I couldn't really follow what happened. Yeah. It was, um, oh, yeah. What the, it should have been Stuart in my opinion. If, if between the two yeah, of them. At yeah. The end. I could not believe <laughs> that. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to talk trash about anyone, but yeah, the Kyle thing was just, I, <laughs> Chemistry, really, though, I Kyle? get <laughs> like, chemistry is chemistry, right? Yeah. So, like, I, 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 I will say, like, if they had the chemistry, like, awesome. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I think that that was part of it. But then you're also thinking, like, okay, but you know, big picture wise, right? Especially it only gets you so kids, far, right? yeah. Right. So, like, what, what else is there? And that's where I wonder if there just, you know, wasn't enough budget, or that, like you said, like maybe there wasn't enough follow up, or they, they showed it to a bunch of people and it didn't have a big, big kick to it, but. Yeah, that was a part of it. I think I was I was just as confused kind of by the end of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and I can't imagine that the viewers were more clear about it than I was because yeah. I knew kind of all the background stuff. <laughs> yeah, because like we love the show. The concept of is it a great is great. But are they doing a season two? Do you know? I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say I, I can't were. imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it was bad. It just seemed. I don't they know. It seems done. difficult to sustain, especially after the first season being like granted a little choppy. I I feel like a lot of it was the editing. They yeah, yeah. they yeah. could have it edits it was really short. Because mm -hmm. what's the Bachelor's like sixteen episodes? I think this was only like eight. I mean, yeah. Survivor sixteen episodes, like a lot more airtime. Mm -hmm. But you know, like there there was no 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 long term relationship come out of it. Yeah. Like none of that. The Bachelor first seasons, like everybody dated at least a couple years. Mm -hmm. So people started to figure out how to like work the story out and yeah, not proof of concept a little out. bit. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we have to wrap up the interview section, but that was really enlightening. It's fun yeah. to hear perspective. Yeah. I'm gonna watch every reality show <laughs> differently now. Like, what are they experiencing? Oh, yes. What is actually mm -hmm. going on? Were they prompted kind of to say that? Some interrogative suggestibility. <laughs> Definitely. And I mean, as you know, you uh, have a lesson prepared, I heard, about reality. Well, I think that's been kind of weaved in. This is sort of an apprenticeship oh, teaching. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. It's a combo so deal. More time for questions. Yeah. Then. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. I would say I definitely have some summary statements if you want like more of like <laughs> a global, like, here's what we learn out of it. But uh, <laughs> absolutely. Going, you tell me, this is yeah. your show. Did you watch Love is Blind? By any chance? Um, I watched a couple episodes of okay. it. And then, uh, what was the other one? Too Hot to Handle. I saw yeah. a couple episodes yeah. of that. Oh, that my too. God. <laughs> that show. Yeah. Wow. What did you think of Too Hot to Handle? I thought it was hilarious, actually. Yeah. Like, the whoever the narrator was, was classic, just great tongue-in-cheek. Mm -hmm. uh, good, good self-deprecation there. And then I think Netflix timed it beautifully. Like, I think the conversation was, like, really honest. Yeah. And I, I, obviously I think the, re, the, the response to it was really very telling. Yeah. And it was surprisingly wholesome too, for what it was. Yeah. The whole <laughs> like lesson they were supposed mm -hmm. to learn behind it. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> like this is yeah. really two sides of a coin in one show. Like I hadn't yeah. ever yeah. seen anything. I did like not it. anticipate it being <laughs> the way it was, but I, yeah. I really liked it. Um, Agreed. So there's love is blind. Let me see what questions we, cause now we have more time. We have I know. so many this is questions. Exciting. I have a really burning question about survivor. Um, Go for it. so when I watch survivor Gabon, I, I get that sugar had her shortcomings, but I really like very strongly felt she should have won, but all of you guys seem to just like despise her. And I just want to know, like, did she just get a really good edit? And then she was horrible around camp. Like, why? Why was that? I didn't understand the whole jerk. Like her not getting a single vote really shocked me. And then Susie getting like three votes or something. It's crazy. Yeah. I think it's, you know, humans are very groupish. Mm -hmm. So these are the lessons, right? I'm, I'm 
panning this out a little okay. bit of like <laughs> take something out of reality. Um, but so, so that was a really great demonstration of that is that the reason Susie got boats was because, you know, honestly, like the, the kind of JV team that was on our season, it was like Crystal and Kenny and mm-hmm. like, you know, they felt connected to her. It wasn't based on gameplay or anything in that sense, sugar, especially towards the end did have some good gameplay sugar. Uh, we're all friends now, but like, you know, she, she was really tough to be around in camp, uh, very kind of petulant and difficult. And that was an easy kind of thing for people to just say like, no, thanks. Yeah. And then we, we took her out of the game sort of strategically, which worked out well for her too. And I think that, but, but partly it was that just, she was just really tough as a person. And then yes, the editing has to make these like sort of two characters, but Susie really didn't have any personality at all. She yeah. was again, one of those people that most people say like, Hey, we'll just vote her out later kind of thing. And that's how it kind of all fell out. So yeah, you're very accurate assessment of the situation basically. Yeah. It seemed odd. Cause I felt like a, Sugar and Bob both played a really good game, but the show, especially toward the last few episodes, made it look like Sugar was kind of calling the shots, which is why it shocked me that she didn't get more votes. But obviously Bob is very likable, so it made sense in that way, I guess. But my feeling is I just imagine myself playing Survivor, and I like to think that if I was sitting on the jury, I'd be able to be objective and not not give good players votes because they're annoying. And I guess that's just never the way it works out in reality. So it's probably just, a yeah. yeah, you're totally engrossed in that world. It's hard to separate, almost impossible. It seems like. One of the things that, again, another life lesson of like, you don't know what else is happening, but mm-hmm. when you think about what happens with jury, so you get, get voted out, you get, I got a sweet helicopter ride to this like unbelievably cool lighthouse that was also converted to a hotel by this cool. French couple. And you're processing like your time out and you're you know, personally frustrated because I think the show went a different direction than where we had the momentum. So you're dealing with that. But the last time you were ever on the actual Island with the people was that, you know, day before you got voted out. And so all of the people you go then and see when you're on the jury are still that person from a few days ago. And what's happened on the show, you don't get to see any of it. Do now, you only Council- hear their testimony? That's it. Yeah, but it's not like a, okay, here's a recap. And then, you know, yeah. it's not sports, sports, uh, ESPN where they do like, you know, last night's game in two minutes. It's, mm-hmm. it's literally just like this conversation. I will say, um, tribal council takes like three hours. Really? So long. Yeah. But there's all these conversations, all stuff. But again, Jeff is making sure you talk about and, and, and listen to exactly what Jeff wants you to talk about and listen to. So you don't have this really good picture of who people were. And then the next person gets voted out and then you get to hear the story from their perspective. But again, that's like, you know, between the person that you were kind of battling before and then what that person is dealing with, which is, I was the first person, so I didn't have anyone to like kind of spill the beans on, but that would, that next person that came up, everyone's really doing their process verbally. And yeah. so you're just getting these like basically inaccurate stories or you know some testament money from somebody and that may or may not be as true as it was supposed to be so i think that's why people go back to like oh well i thought this person was cool i'm just gonna vote for them regardless of how the game was played that makes so much more sense now because i think in my mind i had just assumed that the producers would be filling you all in each episode but yeah knowing that it's a lot easier to understand um, and then also you got voted out, you're on the jury, and then all of your fellow Alliance members start trickling in who are also obviously like Sugar's rivals. So, and then you're getting that information. It, it makes a lot more sense in that yeah, perspective. I, mean, I, I did have trust for like what Charlie and Corinne and Randy mm-hmm. said, but it was also affirmation that like they had kind of switched the show scenario um, to make it a little more... Uh, beneficial to the other group. Yeah. And I think that that's why, you know, we all got kind of put out one after the other. So right. I, I will say knowing that it's very hard to then be like, Oh, well you guys beat me fair and square. Mm-hmm. Um, so I should, I should give you credit for that. And, and more like it felt like, well, you know, if production wasn't here, you know, this game would have been exactly the opposite direction. And so yeah. that didn't sit well with us meritocracy. 
people. <laughs> that makes sense. And so I know that production did a lot of like mixing the tribes up. Is that the only thing they did to kind of skew the results? Or do you think they did other things as well? Like how did, how do you think that worked? I mean, I, so just to clarify, like, look, this is how the game is played. And it's that argument of like fifth foul or mm-hmm. no fouls. But the, the question story, you know, like I was saying, these interviews are, are one way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the way that they did the challenge um, where we're kind of like holding our arms up. Um, I, I don't know. Like mine was literally like, I'm like up here yeah. and Maddie, Maddie was like changing his hands around. I was like, how can you even do that? Like that doesn't, cause so there's little things. I, so do you, I don't, you think they gave Maddie yeah. an advantage in individual? I, I don't know if it's like That's Maddie scandalous. just has like gorilla <laughs> arms and they just like are a foot longer than everyone else. Like, but there, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, there are things that they could do. Yeah. I know when, when we came on that like challenge, Corinne and Charlie and I were kind of like, chatting back and forth and they asked me like, Hey, are you okay? And, and Jeff like lost it. Like he just like started screaming at us and he's like, if anyone says anything else, I'll, you know, you're going to just get kicked off the show right now. Everyone shut the F up. Like what? it was like during because, the challenge, it, like in the little like lead up beforehand, because if Corinne and Charlie had known like, Hey, like things aren't okay over here. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe they'd have tackled Maddie or something like that. So there was like some very, but that's, you know, that's the behind the scenes of yeah. how you kind of wrangle people into it. And then, you know, I'm again, I'm just like, you know, if I follow directions, the teacher will like me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, instead of just being like, screw you, Jeff, like, hey, things are not okay over here. Yeah. I still would like $20 million. Thank you. Were there other instances of that with like with Jeff? Yeah, was Jeff like off camera? Because Jeff in the early seasons, <laughs> Jeff is kind of mean, and now he's a lot like more diplomatic. It seems like, but was he was he harsh like that a lot? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm spilling all the survivor tea. I mean, I think Jeff <laughs> Jeff initially was. I mean, it was cool to talk to Jeff about the early survivor years. I mean, mm-hmm. these guys are making it up as they go along. They've yeah. got this massive hit that they didn't expect. Um. I think he was really tight with cast members. Uh, I know that he dated one of them at one point and then that didn't kind of go well. And I think that really changed his perspective on, you know, Hey, these are my employees and like the boss shouldn't hang out with the employees kind of thing. And so from we, we might've been in that middle phase where he was just like going the opposite direction of like really hands off. Yeah. And then maybe, (laughs) Now he's come to peace with it a little bit. So he's like a little cooler with people. I think it was your season where he screamed at Susie or someone. And he's like, come on, woman. <laughs> and uh, that was uh, yeah. one of my favorite moments. It was so weird. Come on, woman. Yeah, he would just like had these weird spurts of aggression. <laughs> yeah. Jeff was working through some things. Yeah. I guess. Behind the Definitely dimples. Was Jeff, like- <laughs> oh my God. So are you really close still or friends? with any of your like co-worker cast members from any of your reality shows? Uh, well, so like I, I mentioned Joe and Andrew from three are really good friends. I mean, I, I still, I, but I talked to like Charlie recently, Eliza from other survivor seasons. She was, she did amazing race with Corinne. Um, talked to Randy a little bit ago. I'm, I've been chat with Walker and Trent and um, Trent called me a couple of days ago and I owe him a phone call, Gary. Um, it's, I have this like survivor fraternity, sorority, whatever organization that, you know, become, cause there are neat people. Like I think even just meeting you guys, like if I met you in real life, I'd be like, Oh, that's a cool person. Like, thank goodness. Because once you leave school, you don't have this massive group of people that just hang out with all the time. And so, yeah, survivors got some weirdos that come on, but not as many as big brother. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's fun to, to do that. Just like, you know, if I ever got invited to like a bachelor reunion bachelorette situation, I'd probably think there's a bunch of attractive girls and the girls would think there's a bunch of attractive guys. Like that's part of the fun of doing some of this stuff is that type of thing. And, and I think you don't, get to pick your friends, but you get to pick where you meet them. And for me, this has been a great place. I think to me, people that are really fun and interesting and hopefully some of them end up being long-term friends. That's been the case. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. seems like a really great network, especially for everyone to have met on Survivor. I think that there is probably like some common threads in all of you, like the probably the love for adventure and just the will to survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like a, you need a strong mentality to do things like that, especially to have it broadcasted on TV. Um, so totally. that's cool. What about labor of love? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, th those guys continue to be really great sources of connectivity. I, I think for me, labor of love is a lot of affirmation about, you know, what I love about the process and then also what I, I don't need as much as I used to. So I, I really debated going on the show at all um, for a while because I'm not a real fan of the TV part of this process because I know it's it is hurtful ultimately because you have to hear what people really think or you have to admit that. But I rather somebody point out the thing that's stuck in my teeth than to like tell my friend behind my back because yeah. I, I really want that experience. But I don't need the um, the notoriety as much. It was more like that's a that's a that's a positive, I think for the most part, but, um, th that was what I, I loved about the labor of love part was just, I knew I was going to meet some great guys that like, um, Walker, Mario, I did a charity, uh, where we rode a boat from Barcelona to Ibiza, which was 200 miles. And we're raising money for preventable cancers. Uh, they're HPV related, like, um, cervical cancer for women. And Mario met me at the finish line. Um, you know, we hadn't seen each other since the show basically. And like, there he was, I mean, not cool. like finish line was the worst place in the world to go, but the fact that these guys are willing to like be in your life and be present and go on those adventures, like you said, like we have that in common and it takes that in this day and age when you're an adult and you have a job and you're busy, like, how are you going to get up and connect to other people and people who are willing to go, you know, try something brand new are more likely to do that for you. And that feels really important to me and made me feel really good that, at least I came away with that, even if I didn't have a million dollars in one hand and a kid in the other. Yeah. I guess. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one day. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should go on reality yeah. TV. So I like a great desperately <laughs> want to do reality TV. Do you have any tips of how to get on a show? Uh, yeah. So I get this question a lot, actually. Yeah. And I think you guys may be great, amazing race partners. Just, you know. <laughs> think that it's through um, like a lot of I, physical i know i, I want to do reality tv but i don't want it to be hard <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> you'd be really good uh, maybe, on survivor though oh, you're I'd always be, like I'd scheming. Be terrible on survivor i don't think you would I i'm too yeah. i'm too prissy i couldn't sleep outside <laughs> like that yeah speaking See, it would, of. would be great because then they put you in the category of like oh we'll vote her out later and mm. then next thing you know you're 39 days deep so. Yeah, a million yeah. dollars. That's a lot of that money. That is a lot of money. That would solve uh, all my problems. I, think. I can't <laughs> that think would, of a single one that wouldn't that solve. That would be enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, speaking of the living conditions, what was it like, like, using the restroom or showering on Survivor? Yeah. Like, I think, like, I have contacts and I wear glasses. Do people who, like, have contacts go on Survivor? Like, what what does that look yeah. like? So, they do provide your basic needs. Like, um, you know, obviously some basic medical stuff, mosquito repellent. Um, oh, wow. That's good. Well, I mean, malaria. Yeah. You kind of have to, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I, I think you, I had just gotten contact lenses like six months before. And so I'm not very good at putting them in my eyes at this point. And so there was no mirror and there was nothing, you know how, when it sticks to your finger and like, this is like, I'm like a, caveman trying to figure out how to do this <laughs> just at home and now right. i'm out there and I, ha I would have to wipe my the saline off my finger on my like dirty jeans that i've oh, been wearing no. for like two weeks and then stick the contact in my eye so like there were some very real uh situations that came out i mean i had like eye trouble for like a year after that and i yeah. just switched like daily it's crazy but so like they gave you some very basic stuff but the rest was like good luck you know figure it out so like yeah. was now they don't like supply you with food unless it's like a special thing, right? Yeah, there was a bag. We got a bag of rice. It was probably like a 20 pound bag of rice for 39 people or for, for 20 people. Um, I guess it was two bags. So we got two bags for 10 people for 39 days. So it was like, you know, I think I had pretty much like one of these of cooked rice twice a day. And that was it. Oof. Which is nothing yeah so it was 
it was pretty, pretty hard. That is tough. Yeah. And then on top of that, so my question in the earlier seasons, they seem to like make you wear like whatever clothes you would wear to work. Did they, did they make you guys do that? Or was that a choice? Cause people were showing up in like khakis and blazers and I yeah. was confused by that. The, they told us that we were going to do interviews. Um, so they got us in our interview outfits. So they make you pick your outfits and then they yeah. okay them. And um, that was the day we were going to have interviews elsewhere. And I'm a sucker. And I was like, oh, okay, interviews, <laughs> cool. Um, Charlie, who was a like super fan and knew the game, yeah. put on like six extra pair of underwear. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, then, yeah, they literally took some pictures flew a helicopter around us and then we came around the corner and that was the first challenge. Yeah. They lined surprise. us up and said, run up this day. huge hill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They kept giving us water bottles and we're like, God, guys, why are you making us drink all this water? Like, like does oh. anyone want another water bottle? I'm like, I've had six of these and there's nowhere to pee. Like, what are we doing here? And it was because we were about to start the show and they yeah. wanted to make sure we were hydrated enough. Oh my gosh. That's tricky. Yeah. What are little tricksters? <laughs> I know. Well, at least I didn't wear my leopard dress like Sh Sugar did because she got stuck wearing that for yeah. the entire time being. And that's that the tough. only clothes you have. And that makes sense too because in the earlier seasons, you just watch and you're like, why is every woman wearing like a bra or a bikini top, like sports bra and spandex you'd think is like, yeah, we've talked about common what sense. Would wear like, so many there's a, yeah. Stuff popping out everywhere. But yeah, if that's all you have, it makes so much more sense <laughs> yeah. if you yeah. thought you were being interviewed. Yeah. They're tricky and they yeah. do something different every time to do that. So it's, mm -hmm. would I you go, smart. would you do survivor oh, no. again? Yeah, definitely. I not because, well, yeah, I think anything that you don't succeed in or you want to like challenge again, I think I would still go in eyes wide open to the fact that like, look, I have a one in 20 chance of succeeding here. Um, but it's that show in particular is such a complete break from reality and it's such a neat experience. And again, the things you distill from it, you know, which for me are the, the lessons about how you like, learn to trust people, how you, you know, read people and their intentions and then kind of how that all works out. And then the fact that you get to literally watch the experience and kind of see how you did that to me is unbelievable. Like if we did, we do a lot of simulation in medicine. And to me, that's one of the powerful things about that particular show is it is a simulation for how you take on your real life. I mean, you're going to get this tribe of people and they're the people you, you kind of work with to accomplish a goal. But then at the same time, you know, they may be also trying to do the same things that you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to move up in your work, like, so that is the, the duality of being a human being in the world is you want to succeed as an individual, but somehow you also have to master the group part of it. And it, it's an incredible psychological experience and experiment. Uh, and I think it mostly changes people for the better. Although I think everyone has to go through that process and do a lot of internal work afterwards. It took me, uh, probably a couple of years to really kind of get back to feeling like I had processed everything in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still probably have a couple hangups from just that show, but that's, that's what hard things and challenging things in life do is they make you grow a ton and not always positively, but in the end you would do them over again. Anytime someone asked. Yeah. No well, one's asked. What so. do you think? <laughs> what do you think you would do differently if you went on again? Uh, so, so the weirdest part, and this gets back to like, again, here's another life one. I have noticed because not just me, but all my friends that have gone on to do second seasons, um, we always tend to make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that you just make that mistake in a smaller way or further down the road. And so like Corinne is a good example. She, everyone kind of hated her. She's like, kind of says these like kind of mean one-liners, but she yeah. really, really <laughs> She, she's incredibly committed. And like, when you're her friend, she is like, absolutely your friend. She's very dependable. I, I knew I could trust her all the way to the end. Um, and she goes through the same experience and kind of does the same exact thing, like right about the same time in, in the next season that she goes on. And so, you know, she says the one liners, those things, but then she has her very trusting group. I think my difference in this other setting would have been to just really be mindful of my tendency is 
you know, because of my work is to always give up my needs first and mm-hmm. think about, you know, how can I incorporate other people? And so on my season of survivor, um, crystal is actually, uh, cousins with like, this is the weirdest connection. The guy that I lifted weights with like every single day of my medical school life, uh, he's one of my best friends. His name's Kenny Cox and crystal Cox is his cousin. And they're like, not like, like, random cousin, like super tight family. And so I was like, Oh crap. Like here's this person who is clearly not on my side here. Uh, but I owe Kenny, like, I'm Mm -hmm. going to feel like such a jerk if I go home. And and I think that was kind of me trying to give myself an excuse to, to not be selfish. And honestly, it's just been like, Hey, cool. Like Kenny's not going to be mad at me. Like, let me just kind of stick to my plan here. And so I was trying to you know, make everyone happy. And that tends to be probably the mistake that I would make again on the show. And the same thing happened in labor of love in the sense of trying to really honor Christie's point of being there and, you know, make sure that cause she had come to us when, um, Keith was kind of talking about his anger frustrations and situations and said, Hey guys, there's this stuff going on in the house. I have no idea what's happening. Like, I don't know if I can end up with anyone if I have to worry about these, you know, kind of blindsiding experiences Mm -hmm. and every single guy in the house. And she's like, is there, if there's anyone else in the house who's like proving to be hard to live with or has an issue like this, I need to know. And literally all of us are like, (laughs) Kyle, but we felt like, again, the same thing. I was like, I knew this would not help my game to game. Right. But my Mm -hmm. process to do any favors for her, for her. But I felt like, okay, you know, the right thing to do here is to, to speak up and say something. Mm-hmm. And that's that same process that just like Survivor, I felt like, let me do what's best for everyone. Instead of just knowing that there's some times where you just got to say, look, like, this is also her responsibility to do the work. And, you know, I have to let that play out. And if other people feel, you know, I don't have to be take the lead on every single, you know, altruistic thing on the planet here. And so I think that's, you know, probably what I would do differently. Yeah. And that makes sense. And it's probably so hard to do that differently when you know you're being watched by your friends and family and they're going to see that. Yeah. Um, That's such an empath like thing to do, like putting everyone else before your needs. So my question from that is, do you feel like people with certain personality types thrive more than others on reality shows, like competitive ones? Have you seen any of that? Yeah. I I think there's, I'm, I'm sort of like a a pretty nerdy person and I, I definitely think I have more personality than like a a very introverted person, but there are people who are just very socially and emotionally intelligent and they have this charisma about them and they do really well on survivor. I think Kim Spradlin is wolf is a good example. Um, Michelle Fitzgerald is a great example. They're, there are these people who have like a great charisma and you know, the same way that I'm really good at like figuring out the clues in a math problem. They're really good at figuring out the body language and what they need to tell people to make them comfortable. And then there's another group. that's just like, I think it's the fifth foul kind of people who really just understand that like, Hey, if I pan out and I'm just cut myself off kind of emotionally from this, like, I don't want to say they're like psychopaths, but like literally <laughs> they're able to just say, Hey, look, this is, this is just a game. Yeah. You know, in a year, nobody cares. Um, let's just do this. I think those people also do really well. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think everyone has to decide in their hearts, where in life do I want to do this? Um, yeah, it's important for you to succeed and and do well and get what you need. And there's also the time where you say like, Hey, yeah, but the whole group needs to also survive and do well and prosper. And, you know, I think we're all struggling to figure out where that line is for ourselves. Yeah. That'd be weird to try to strike that balance, especially on, TV competitively for a million (laughs) dollars. Yeah. And people are going to give you a hard time no matter what you do. Like the number of people that were like, Oh, you're an idiot for throwing the idol in the water or whatever. And I'm like, (laughs) Oh yeah. I forgot about that. (laughs) Yeah. And then if I hadn't and someone else had gotten it and used it against me, I would have been an idiot for not throwing it in the water. And you know, that's kind of when that all bubbles over in like real life, you just have to say like, okay, I appreciate what the fourth wall has to say. I appreciate what others have to say. And now I have to kind of make this internal decision and not worry about the opportunity costs that may or may not happen. 
especially knowing that you're never going to see half of the things that your choice would have been because you didn't make that choice. So now yeah. you're never going to know what's, you know, what the outcome would have been. And you shouldn't sit there and question it. Oh it, yeah. Ultimately. That's Absolutely. torture. <laughs> and especially now seeing how far survivor has come where having an idol is pretty much like the ultimate goal and watching it from a perspective where you've seen those later seasons, it's easy to judge that decision, but this is like the beginning of the idol. So that, yeah. And I think randomness benefits survivor, right? That's mm -hmm. the whole idea of like, if we get people too ingrained, I think they also realize the audience starts to like that group and organizations because humans have that desire to be part of groups. Mm -hmm. But if you keep things random, so everyone's got an idol, you can never get past that initial kind of trust activation energy. And that's where, the show has become really interesting because of that. But I think it's also a bit of the degradation of group building and trust formation. And honestly, I think that is a little reflective of like society in general. So if there's another reality lesson for you of where we're at too many choices, too many opportunities to, you know, choose personal over group. And I think that makes for some really interesting times. Yeah, I think it's great. There's so many lessons about reality within reality TV shows because I didn't really watch reality TV shows until like the last year or so. And it uh, there's just it's so much more real than I thought it it was truly. Um, but we have time for one more question. Yeah. And I think there is a, maybe one burning question on our <laughs> minds. Yeah. So I think for us in our house, you're pretty uh, famous for um, introducing Christy and the world to your house mom. So uh, yes. <laughs> we'd love to know more about her. Uh, so Diana, Tana is my other house mom. Diana she's, and she's Tana works in the background. Tana and Diana, yep, okay, they're best sweet. friends. Oh, they were teachers Aww. and they retired, and they both raised kids and they wanted some other things to do in life, and so they help a bunch of different people and just happened to let me into their lives too. That's and cool. Yeah, I, it seems like a nicer way to talk about people that you're hiring as employees to kind of help you do things. So. Right. And a yeah. lot of times employees do become like family and that makes sense. The way the show seemed to spin it, it was just, I think different than it is. Yeah. In yeah. Life. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you choose, like, did the show tell you choose someone to introduce Christy to, or did they like have you give them a list and they chose that because they knew they could do something with it? Well, yeah. So I would say like my date, I was, it was fascinating to watch the dates yeah. because I was like, wait, how did they, Kyle got to do this? Like yeah. wait, Stuart's partying in a house that's not even his, like yeah. what's going on in here? <laughs> um, my best friend and his wife who. You're breaking up a little bit. Um, you're frozen. Be, this is the, the FBI is ruining my <laughs> house mom conversation. But yeah, so they wouldn't let, they didn't let my best friend come on the show. Um, we had talked about the house mom things because it was a way of me demonstrating like of all the guys, like I really practice this stuff daily knowing that when the opportunity does come, I want to have this like support system mm -hmm. that isn't always, everyone loves to talk about this stuff. But, like how do you actually get some help? Well, you got to go on a website, you got to meet people. Like, so let me do this stuff while I'm sitting here so that when I meet the right person, we have these, op we have these options at least we don't have mm -hmm. to do them, but you know, they're there. And so that was the approach I was coming from. Little did I know <laughs> that they were going to turn this into this like big conversation. And yeah. even like the whole pants thing was, it was oh, just a yeah. funny conversation. So <laughs> yeah. like I have a sewing machine. I sew my own stuff all the time. And my, I wanted to learn from my grandmother because she taught me. And so this was actually part of another conversation that I sort of had with Christy about the fact that like, I can really I'm not really looking for a partner to like do all this stuff for me. Like I, I want an actual teammate and somebody who, you know, can do things on their own, but we're sort of choosing to do these other things. And that was part of what I was demonstrating there. Little did I know again, that this was going to go in this totally bizarre yeah, direction. They so. spun it in this weird thing. And Christy ended up when she ended your relationship, she kind of, I felt like put a lot of the blame on you having the house mom, which doesn't really make sense in the true context. Do you think that was right. a, kind of a cop out? Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think it's, I, the, the rest of that conversation as I remember it, like was, I think I represented something in her past that she was trying mm -hmm. to like disprove. Yeah. Um, 
and looking back, like the conclusions she derived from some of the things she saw were just so bizarre that it's like, man. And that was kind of what I was feeling. I was like, if somebody's going to see my actions and conclude the exact opposite, like imagine trying to have a relationship like that. And yeah. I think I've had a couple of those and I was like, man, I don't think. Yeah. That it kind of seemed like good. her mind was so. already made up and there was yeah. not really even a chance yeah. to communicate about it. It's really cool though, hearing your perspective directly mm-hmm. about Diana and Tana. Um, so thank you for yeah. sharing yeah. that. Yeah. And it'll be cool one day, you know, when you do have your, your partner and start a family to already have that relationship with the two of them. Um, if you know, everything works out that way. Absolutely. But, and yeah. I, I hope it does work out. You've been an absolute joy to have on the show. Thank you so much. We wish yeah, you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we wish you all the best in life, and we hope we can talk to you again someday. Yeah, we won't keep you any longer. Yeah. You have a long night of work ahead of you, right? Yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah more two. coffee ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah, drink all the coffee. I need some right now as well. I'm fading fast. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, Thank you guys for having me and good luck with the teaching in this new semester. As I know it's not an easy thing for you to be doing either. So yeah, thanks. It's going to be We're a while. Ride. Need it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank sure. you for taking the time this morning. We have our little outro that we yeah. do. Um, okay. Do you want to, do you know about this yet, Marcus or no? Okay. So okay. we say three, two, one and we'll cat says three, two, one. And then we'll all say class dismissed. Uh, love okay. It. Are we this. ready? Yep. All right. Some well, nervous. Guess it's time and <laughs> <laughs> all right, three, two, one, class, class dismissed. Class dismissed. Cheers. Have a great day, Marcus. Have a Thank good day. You. Thank you guys. Again. Enjoy. Hopefully see you in Nashville sometime. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> see you soon.